the photographs were part of the documentation, as indeed some of the film you see in the classroom. So we expected uh, that would be available, and there was actually quite a lot of news footage and rushes of news footage. What you saw in the laboratory, for example, was a news story that was done about Nim at the time he was put in that facility, and therefore they shot rushes, and we managed to track down very, very great, uh, yeah, great length it took us to get to those rushes. But so we found lots of material we hadn't been aware of. Likewise, the encounter he has with his first proper chimpanzee, which was again film we hadn't we didn't know that existed, and that was a probably the most amazing discovery we made was that when you see him not knowing who he is, not knowing what he is, with another chimpanzee, and that that's kind of it was very moving and very, I found that very upsetting that footage because. You see this very bewildered creature who doesn't know he's signing and he's trying to hang on to human beings, not knowing who he is at that point in time. So we were very fortunate that the film could be constructed largely from you know authentic footage of, of Nim and photographs. And he agreed to be in it. I think he was expecting a film that was celebrating the science and his achievements. But he's very used to talking about it. He's quite well known for this experiment because it reached a conclusion that's never yet been disproved that chimpanzees can't you know, create language with grammar and syntax the way humans can. That's a whole other kind of discussion. But um, So I approached him saying, we're making a story about Nim. And he happily sat down and spoke to me for many hours. He wasn't very forthcoming about his personal life, which was fair enough. Um, and I kept asking him about you know, the women in the project and his relationship with them. And he was very evasive about that. But as you see, that kind of worked in the story in a different kind of way because they were very open about their relationships. So in a sense, one of the, I think one of the principles I had for the film was that if you're a professor in this experiment, you have lots of power and you preside over a power structure and you're privileged. And in this film, he's not privileged. He's just one of the people who witnessed and did what he did. And, and I, I would say this, that I wouldn't, I don't judge him in the film, but I do show you his decisions and his actions. And again, in this film, like with Man on Wire, you're, I think, invited to complete the film on a moral level for yourself. Um, but he, he, he hasn't, doesn't like the film and, and has been quite hostile towards it, but can't actually cite any specific you know, fact or aspect of it that, that he can sue me for or sue us for. So he's angry about it. And he's been on National Public Radio in America berating me personally about it. But I've made the film, and that's my kind of part of the dialogue. There it is. Um, and you know, he's very entitled to have his view, but what I would say is that, I would say this publicly, he's a very sloppy scientist. <laughs> and, and I don't want to be a sloppy filmmaker. And so if that's the argument we're having, I, on that level of discipline, you know, I think this film is you know, fairly accurate and, and no one is suing us for it. And I think the science in, in the project is often preposterous. You, you put the chimpanzee in a family that can't, you can't even sign. Um, and on and on and on and on, you know, you, you set him up with people that you're having relationships with and, and, and you just abandon him. So I think those actions speak for themselves. I wouldn't call him a villain, but I, I would call him someone with a, quite a cold heart, which maybe is worse, or maybe it's the same. The, the, the research laboratory vet was very, very reluctant to be on camera. He spoke to me quite openly on the phone and I met with him. And it took a long time for him to, to feel comfortable that I wasn't just setting him up to make him into, you know, a, a sort of experimental Nazi, which he isn't. And it's much more complicated than that. And, and my view of him is that he's a good man in a, in a very bad world. And in fact, it was Bob Ingersoll who reassured him and called him and said, look, this guy means to do right by the story. And he's a very important part of the story because he saw him in that facility and, I guess looked after him, if that's the right word for it. Um, and I think his, his role in the film is very important. And so I sort of ended up spending a year courting him and eventually he agreed to come and speak openly about what, what he saw and what he th thought. And, and he actually kind of liked the film when he saw it. He thought I had respected what I undertook to respect when we, when we spoke. But everyone else was kind of up for it and, and game. It was actually helpful that I was approaching people just after Man on Wire won an Oscar. So I could say, Oscar winning filmmaker, go and be in my film. And uh, people were kind of queuing, queuing up to be in it. And then they watched Man on Wire. <laughs> well, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, I, I meet the people beforehand and try and spend time with them, and not as a, a filmmaker, but just as a human being. 
Um, so I think there's an element of familiarity and trust. They're talking to me. They're not talking to an interviewer. And also, I'm not. I'm very. I don't. I just listen. I don't ask a lot of questions, and I plan the questions out really quite carefully. Um, not everyone wants to kind of hang out with you, and not. And that's fine. the professor didn't want to meet very much beforehand. He just showed up on the day, and I interviewed him. Um, but that's one important part of it is that you you do create some kind of trust, and that gives you a responsibility when you have the film in the cutting room, you created that trust. And I'm not in the business of trying to you know, assassinate people with the films that I do. I want to try and understand their complexity and not make overt moral judgments about, you know, boo, hiss, here's the villain. Um, so, uh, so when we do them, we do them over the course of maybe of a day, and it takes four or five hours of, of back and forth, and it's kind of fairly intense, and, but it's just me and them, and everything else is dark around us. So it's it kind of it, the, the, the circumstances are very cozy, if that can be true of a film camera, you know, <laughs> being in the room as well. But that's what I try to do, and try to put people. I don't, I don't threaten them. I don't interrogate them. I don't confront them. I coax, I guess, and 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 sort of <laughs> fish gently for what I'm after and what they want to offer. And in fact, you know, what's interesting is that in this film. A lot of people were very guilty about what had happened, and I guess generally a guilty mind wants to confess in some way. And so I felt sometimes I was acting. In fact, Stephanie, uh, who's in the film, was, was, had been in, in psychoanalysis for 50 years. She said I was the best therapist she ever had. <laughs> but, uh, so, it, which uh, maybe it's a, not a, not a compliment, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but she said I waste all that money. I just sit down and talk to you every week, and I'll be fine. So maybe there's a, there's a touch of that going on too. That you are trying to read people's psychology and, and, and I guess, you know, try and respect what they're offering you and, and not to, you know, I don't go in for confrontational interviews. But one thing was to try and organize the film for you in a way that was coherent so you could see people arriving in this quite, you know, picaresque story, this complicated story where people come and go in, in Nim's life. And that was the idea was that they come and just, they just go and he doesn't see them ever again. And so that the camera, in a sense, quite crudely shows you them arriving and then off they go. So I explained to them that that's what I was doing. I wanted to create a kind of, I said it's a photograph, it's like an image, but it's moving to show you coming into Nim's life and you leaving Nim's life. And so uh, they were aware that that was the idea. And so f I, I, it was a way of organizing, the, you know, the, there's quite a lot of people in a documentary. Usually documentaries focus on three or four people. This has 10 people. And so this was a way, I think, of trying to show you who was coming and who was going. Ste Stephanie's husband, the poet Will Lafarge, would have been a very fascinating interview uh, because he's the first male that Nim goes after as a poet. You know, he's kind of vulnerable and Nim sees his weakness, as, uh, which, you know, his weakness can be strength in other situations, but with a chimpanzee, <laughs> if you're weak, they're going to bite you and they're going to pinch your testicles and, and other things, all of which happened to Weir. So I'd love to have asked him about his testicles being pinched and, and, and that kind of thing. But it, unfortunately, he's not around. I once did a film where I, I tried to c contact someone through a medium uh, many years ago in my early career. It was you know, only half serious. Uh, and and the, the medium, was like Agatha Christie, the, the writer, and, and I found her kind of frustrating and boring. I was forced to make this film when I was working at the BBC. And, so I tried to make it in a way that was subversive, so I got a medium to kind of get in touch with her and find out what she thought about my film. And she didn't like it very much. Well, it came on the back of Man on Wire, and in fact, it started with a book that was written by a, a writer in America who wrote somewhat the same story, the life story of Nim, but her view was, was much more from an animal rights you know, perspective, and it was kind of a campaigning book. Um, and I did not feel comfortable doing that kind of work, so I, I extracted from the book essentially this idea of making a biography of an animal. I thought that was a very interesting challenge to kind of focus a film on the life story of an animal. I hadn't quite seen it before. You see it in fiction, but I've seen a documentary that had done that. Um, there may well be ones that you can tell me about, but I haven't seen one. Uh, so that became interesting just to kind of say, well, can I tell the life story of a chimpanzee through the medium of film um, and make it into a, like a biopic, I guess. So it's, in that way, it's quite a conventional film. It's a biopic, but it happens to be of a, of a chimpanzee. Would have seen there were kind of reconstructions that I shot, and it's probably that that credits make it into something. There's actually a lot less of it than in Man on Wire. And what we did was literally, it's a man in a very cheap chimp suit running about, 
and those are used to glimpse it. So I'm not, I mean, what we couldn't do and we wouldn't do is to use a real chimpanzee to show you events in them's life that clearly weren't filmed and couldn't have been a film for one reason or another. So I tried, I tried to make it so you'd see these are little glimpses of this sort of hairy character running around. So the poodle sequence is an example of that. Um, so the credits sort of suggest it's some kind of big Hollywood production. And it's really just a chimp in person, a very good one, by the way. Um, running around in a fairly flea-bitten old chimp suit. And now I've ruined the mysteries of the film for you. It's a Muppet movie, actually.